Lesson 10.3 is exponential functions and models. Exponential functions are functions where you have a base that's being raised to the power of whatever your input or your independent variable is. The general form of an exponential function is f of x equals k times a to the x plus c, where a is positive and k is not zero. So we don't ever look at negative bases. And exponential functions can be used to model real-world situations where you have some kind of constant percentage change. So you're increasing by 20% or you're decreasing by 5% um, or anything that's repeated multiplication. Every exponential function has a horizontal asymptote. A horizontal asymptote is a boundary line, a horizontal boundary line that the graph can't cross or touch. For the exponential function, if you have c as being whatever's being added on to the end, then that is what the horizontal asymptote is, y equals c, for that exponential function. And then lastly, we have the natural, ex natural exponent e. e is an irrational number, an irrational constant, with a value of about 2.71828, continuing on forever in some not pattern. Very, think of it very similar to pi. From now on, whenever we see e, e is our natural exponent e. It is not a variable. This slide is a review of laws of exponents, so I would maybe pause the video and write these down just to remind ourselves. So remember, a exponent is repeated multiplication, so if I multiply something by itself in times, it's the same thing as writing it as x to the n. Anything to the first power is itself. Anything to the zero power except for zero is one. If I multiply two things with the same base, I can add the exponents together. If I divide two things with the same base, I can subtract the exponents. If I raise a power to a power, we can multiply the exponents. We can also, if we're multiplying or dividing, not adding or subtracting, multiplying or dividing, inside of something that's being raised to a power, we can distribute that power to the quotient or both parts of the product or the quotient. And if you have something that has a negative exponent, that means it's a reciprocal. So if it's x to the negative n power, that's the same thing as 1 over x to the n. Or if the negative's in the denominator, that flips it up to the numerator. So for this first example, we're given two functions, and for each of the functions, we want to find the equation of the horizontal asymptote, the coordinates of the point where the graph cuts the y-axis, which is the same thing as saying the y-intercept, and then state whether or not the graph is increasing or decreasing. You may need to use your graphing calculator for the last part to test whether it's increasing or decreasing, but go ahead and pause the video and find those three pieces for both of these functions. So for the first one, we talked about on the previous slide that your horizontal asymptote is always just y equals whatever's being added or subtracting on the end because that's your vertical shift. And normally an untransformed exponential function has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So for this first one, f of x equals 3 to the x plus 2, the horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals 2. For the second one, I plugged in 0. Anything to the 0 power is 1, so you end up with 3 to the 0 power plus 2, which is 1 plus 2 or 3. So your coordinate for the y-intercept is 0, 3. And then looking at the graph of this function, it's an increasing function. For the second one, f of x equals 5 times 0 0.2 to the x minus 3. Again, whatever is being added or subtracted is our horizontal asymptote, so y equals negative 3. If I plug in 0 for x, you get 5 times 0 0.2 to the 0 minus 3. Well, 0 0.2 to the 0 is going to be 1, so you end up with 5 minus 3, which is 2. So your y-intercept occurs at 0, 2. And then if you look at the graph of this function, it is a decreasing function. So if you have a base that is greater than 1, that means you're multiplying by something that's bigger than 1, so your numbers are going to be getting bigger every single time. So that's always going to be an e increasing function, which we call exponential growth. If you have a base that is between 0 and 1, that means you're multiplying by something that's less than 1, so basically you're dividing which means your values are getting smaller every single time, so that's always going to be a decreasing function, and we call that exponential decay. This next example, it says the temperature of a cup of coffee is modeled by the equation f of x equals 65 times 1.9 to the negative x plus 20, where f of x is the temperature in degrees Celsius and x is the time in minutes. So using technology, we want to sketch the graph of this function f of x for x is between 0 and 12. So graph it on your graphing calculator and then copy that sketch over. And then once you have that, go ahead and answer the following questions. So what is the initial temperature of the coffee? Evaluate f of 4 and explain its meaning. Evaluate f of x equals 50 and explain its meaning in context. And then what is the equation of the horizontal asymptote and explain what it represents. So go ahead and pause the video and try this one. 
So first part, we have our sketch of our graph here. So I just plugged it in my graphing calculator and sketched it from 0 to 12. So I have my time in minutes on the x-axis, the temperature in degrees Celsius on the y-axis. I have it scaled by going up by 10. I figured out where um, it's going to cross the x-axis here, and then it's going to curve down here towards the horizontal asymptote line. Notice that even though our A value or our base here is greater than 1, it's still a decreasing or a decay function, and that's because of the negative in the exponent. So that's reflecting it across the y-axis. Um, this would actually, you could apply the negative exponent here. It's really 1 over 1.9. So that's why it's a decay instead of a growth, even though A is bigger than 1. For part B, it says, what is the initial temperature of the coffee? So I plugged in 0 for X. Um, so 1.9 to the 0 power, that's just 1 times 65 plus 20. So the initial temperature of the coffee is 85 degrees Celsius. Part C says evaluate F of 4 and explain its meaning in context. So I plugged in 4. Um, you could also use your graphing calculator to evaluate it. You end up with 25.0 degrees Celsius. So what that means is that the temperature after 4 minutes is going to be 25.0 degrees Celsius. Part D says evaluate f of x equals 50 and explain its meaning in context. So I set this equal to 50, and then on my graphing calculator, I went back into y equals, and I had y1, or excuse me, y2 be 50. And so I had a second graph here, and I found where they intersected, and I found that to be at 1.20. So the temperature will be 50 degrees Celsius after 1.20 minutes. And then last part, part E, says what's the equation of the horizontal asymptote? Well, we have a plus 20 on the end, so that means my horizontal asymptote is going to be at y equals 20. I also put that on the sketch of the graph here. So you can see how the graph kind of hugs that horizontal asymptote, but it's never going to touch or cross it. So it's that boundary line, which in context, it would mean that's a temperature that it can't ever get colder than. So most likely it's the temperature of the environment, the room that the coffee cup is in, um, because it's never going to drop below whatever the surrounding temperature is. In this next example, it says that Bailey invests $2,000 US dollars into a bank that pays interest at a rate of 4.5% per annum or per year, compounded monthly. So this is a compound interest problem. We, talk about, we talked about this back in section 10.2. So we want to write a function to model how much money Bailey will have in her bank after X years. And then sketch a graph to model how much money they'll have in their bank after X years. Calculate how much money they will have in their bank after four years and how long it will take to have $3,000 US dollars in the bank. So using what we talked about in 10.2 with compound interest, go ahead and try this problem. So using the compound interest, our present value is 2,000, our interest rate is 4.5, our compounding periods is 12, and then our unknown, we're going to leave as x, is our years. So I plugged that into our compound interest, and then I just simplified it a little bit, and I got 2,000 times 1.00375 to the 12x. So that's our function that models how much money Bailey will have in their account after x years. So then down here, I sketched a model. The only thing is this is not completely accurate because it's not going to be continuous. It would technically be discrete with every month the amount of money jumping up because that's when they're earning interest, um, but it's an okay model. So la the next part says calculate how much money Bailey will have in the account after four years. So plug in X to be four, you end up $11,707.36 US cents. And then the last part, part D, says calculate how long it will take for her to have 3,000 US dollars in the bank. So I set our function equal to 3,000 and solve for x. I just put y2 as 3,000, and I found where they intersected. And it was 0 0.918 years. But again, it's not continuous. It's discrete per month. So I calculated that this was a little bit over 11 months. So it would basically round up to one year. After one year, she would have $3,000 in her account. We also talked about depreciation in 10.2. So here's another example. Saul buys a tractor for 51,000 US dollars. The price of the tractor reduces or depreciates by 8% each year. We want to write a function that models the situation, find the price of the tractor after four years, and find the number of years until the tractor is worth half its original value. So go ahead and pause the video and try this one. So if it's depreciating by 8% each year, that means that the value keeps 92% of its worth. 
So the value of the tractor is going to be its original amount, 51,000, times how much it's keeping, so 0 0.92, to the x power. So f of x equals 51,000 times 0 0.92 to the x. Find the price of the tractor after four years. So just plug in x to be four, and you end up with $36,536.04. And then lastly, how long until they have exactly half, um, or its worth is half the original value? So half of 51,000 is 25,500. Set them equal to each other. Use your graphing calculator to find where they intersect, and you end up with x to be 8.31 years. And I'm going to assume that depreciation is continuous. It doesn't jump from year to year. So I'm just going to leave it as 8.31 years. In this last example, we have a data table that represents the number of bacteria in a sample recorded each week. And so we have weeks 0, 1, 2, and 3, and how much bacteria was in the sample during that week. First thing we want to do is we want to plot this scatter plot on our graphing calculator and determine whether this is linear or exponential growth. So go ahead and pause the video and try those. So using my graphing calculator, I went to stat edit and I put my x's under L1 and my y's under L2. And then I went to y equals, I made sure my stat plot was turned on and I looked at my graph in the correct window and I can see that it's exponential. It's increasing faster here at the end than it was in the beginning. Even if you look at the table, the first time it increases by 4, and then by 6, and then by 12, so your increasing is getting bigger as well. So then we can find a representation and exponential regression using our graphing calculators, just like we have done the other ones before. So if you go into stat, go over to calc, if you go down to number 0, that's your exponential regression. So you can use that to find an equation to represent this data. And then once you have that function, estimate the number of bacteria that will be in the sample after 10 weeks and state whether this will be reasonable. So go ahead and pause the video and try parts C and D. So using my graphing calculator, I found the function to be 3.19 times 2.01 to the x. And then plugging in x to be 10 for 10 weeks, I found 3,429 bacteria. I think this is pretty reasonable. Bacteria grows at a very fast rate and it won't stop unless it's forced to stop. Um, so it's, it's probably reasonable. If this was something that wasn't bacteria, you kind of have to think about like, would it grow to be that extent? Would it continue to grow after 10 weeks when you're looking at whether or not something is reasonable? So this has been exponential functions and modeling with exponential functions.